Thanks, Christian. Uh, Skip Newberry, President and CEO of the Technology Association of Oregon. We're uh, really pleased to be partnering with New Relic uh, throughout the year on a number of programs and uh, really pleased to support the Future Talk series um, here tonight. Um, we have a great lineup of, uh, of speakers you're going to hear from tonight, uh, but before I, I get to them, um, I wanted to also call out uh, Joel Barrett with Uno Square, uh, who's been a big supporter of a lot of the work we've been doing in the Devon engineering community over uh, many years now. And uh, Joel? Speak from here, wow, you're loud. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you. So for tonight, we have Alan Fern, who's a professor at Oregon State University in Corvallis, and, and also Sergey Raisin, who's the CTO at Sios Corporation. And uh, Sergey's um, actually contributed to a lot of really interesting and important uh, open source projects and machine learning. Uh, he's going to be kicking us off, and then we'll shift uh, after his presentation to Alan, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about some AI trends. And then we're going to do some Q&A, and we're going to try and make it as interactive as possible uh, with questions from the audience as well. So, uh, Sergey, kick it off. Sorry. Hey, hi. Uh, my name is Sergey Ryzen. I'm the uh, CTO for SIOS. So the uh, sort of the theme slash title of this topic is AI uh, is coming. Are you ready? And through the story of self driving data center. Um, just a little bit about SIOS uh, and who we are. Uh, SIOS has been around uh, for roughly about uh, 15 years, uh, spin off from uh, ATT and CR in a space of high availability and in, in, in data replication for those who are familiar with clustering and things like that. Um, and uh, so something that I'm going to talk to you about is sort of a new product that we're working on, which is called SIOS IQ, uh, which is specifically in the area of machine learning uh, uh, applied to IT operations and DevOps and things like that. So before I start, uh, I was just curious, uh, how many of you are actually involved or related to IT uh, operations in general? Could you raise your hands, please? All right. Uh, how about the uh, application development or databases and uh, things like that? Okay, so quite a bit of you. So I'm sure this topic will be somewhat interesting and, and familiar to you. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, uh, so I've been pretty much sort of practicing uh, application of machine learning and uh, sort of statistical analysis of data uh, in a variety of spaces uh, for the past I guess 15 years. Uh, first, I worked for a company called Kaspersky Labs in the area of network security, uh, where we applied essentially a principle of acoustical modeling uh, to identify anomalies in the encrypted network traffic, which is kind of an interesting uh, problem. Uh, since I worked in acoustical mo acoustical modeling um, and was familiar with sort of like it's kind of a trend of spe speech recognition now, I joined a startup called Kanida, which we did something very similar to uh, what Siri does today, except like 13 years ago. And uh, I was a speech engineer who actually worked on a speech recognition engine that was powering this product. Uh, you know, it was kind of early on, uh, and everybody was still kind of scratching their head, why, why would you even have something like this? And um, as a visionary, visionaries, uh, we sort of got acquired by a company called Avaya, Intel Communications, kicked off another product called, called Voice Portal, where I was speech engineer once again. Uh, also worked in a startup called Iteca, where we did human behavior analysis. Uh, and then I went through another signal processing kind of organization. And prior to joining SIOS, where I started working on SIOS IQ, I spent about five years uh, in EMC CTO office, primarily focusing on what kind of uh, things, uh, problems, I should say, will emerge as, you know, with the space of virtualization, cloud, software-defined networking, and all those great things as a lot of data flows in, a lot of changes uh, happening, and whether machine learning could be a good application or solution for these for problems. So uh, I will talk about, basically, 
actually at different levels. I'll talk about why we actually cho chosen machine learning for this particular vertical in the first place. Uh, and also I'll talk about uh, sort of the approach we have taken and sort of the state of uh, IT, I guess, and their view, uh, IT operations, and uh, their view at machi on machine learning and whether, whether it can help them and how they think about it. So as far as what is machine learning, I mean, we obviously all are familiar with the fact that it's being used today in, in a variety of areas. And it's like as users of it, uh, we simply know that it's powers something there in the areas, whether it's like speech recognition, video games, search engines, and things like that. So like maybe not to the extent of algorithms that are being used, but in general that it exists in those particular spaces. Uh, well, uh, when we talk to the customers, uh, what do they actually think about machine learning? Uh, because we basically try to sort of educate the market uh, of IT operations, what, uh, what machine learning can bring to them, what kind of benefits. But this is sort of like typically the uh, input uh, that we're getting. Like, for example, when we talk about uh, automated root cause analysis based on the uh, behavioral analytics, uh, you get a lot of nods, but at the same time, you get some questions like, well, uh, so what is machine learning after all? It's like we're saying, well, this is machine learning. It is based on uh, on the you know historical data. It's based on the uh, patterns that we have recognized. Well, to some people, unless you do doing predictive analysis, you're not doing machine learning. So from the from the perspective of sort of like some of the users. Um, some people think that you know, all that insight that you may be gathering, like for example, what are the root cause of the problems, is actually hidden somewhere in the data. So you have to tap into some secret data source that uh, nobody else tapped into uh, versus basically massaging the data, ultimately what machine learning does, right? Uh, to some people, it's automation. You know, so basically, unless you provide them an automated sort of like robotic approach to uh, sort of uh, operations, uh, they don't think it's actually uh, a machine learning is applied. Uh, to some people, they actually just think that they need one of those things. It doesn't matter what it is. They're just somewhere on the checklist that we need to have a tool. Do you guys do machine learning? Uh, yes, okay, great. If you don't, okay, well, sorry, we, you know, we're not interested, right? Without understanding um, a specific space. There's a lot of fluff in this space as well. I mean, if you think about IT operations and the tools that are available today, almost everyone claims to do machine learning. But whether they actually do that, whether it's actually beyond the marketing, uh, it's uh, typically, it's, it's not the case. Uh, so this is basically sort of uh, also challenging as we talk to customers because we be you we be, being compared all other tools that perhaps uh, do some form of a, either uh, regression analysis or something like that where basically uh, the concept of pattern recognition is not really involved and <clears throat> in a lot of cases uh, you know of course you have a more of a computer science approach where basically there is some sort of a either thresholds or uh, event suppression uh, as being considered as such. Like for example, okay, so if there's 14,000 alerts happening, we're going to suppress all of them and give you one. Well, it, it, it does help sort of with the noise, but it actually doesn't provide the ultimate uh, sort of insight of what you should be looking for in, a, in a IT data. So as far as like what what is machine learning and what can it provide to you, right? So um, this is a lot of questions we, uh, I mean, this is ultimately what the users are looking for when we're talking to them in terms of like, okay, so you guys have all this approach, but why, why do I care? Is it better? Is it cheaper? Is it faster? What, what is it? Well, um, the way we found to be the most effective to talk to our users is in actually in the perspective of productivity, right? So like, you know, if you look at this uh, chart that has been posted recently, Force Magazine, you know, the productivity of, uh, in general, has dropped uh, very low in the recent years, right? And if you think about it in terms of like, uh, even in IT operations, the some form of virtualization and all those dynamic things that are emerging that should actually help. But in the reverse, I think uh, they actually make things more complicated. They actually like, sort of like, uh, technology pushes the uh, sort of logic of trying to optimize certain types of operations, but at the same time, from the perspective of the people who, who, who have to maintain those operations, it's actually not very effective. And I'll talk more about that as we talk about the data scale and, and things like that. So, um, of course, the IoT is a big deal, right? Basically, um, you know, the, the marketeers and those guys are love this stuff because suddenly you have all the data that comes from all the devices. You... Um, um, 
you're able to figure out or maybe even predict certain behaviors of the customers, what can you sell them in the future and all this stuff. But even from IT operations, it creates a big challenge. Like, for example, like a recent DNS attack, which brought down, brought down the whole Internet, right, uh, through, the, uh, through uh, some form of... Um, so it was an IT devices that actually effectively uh, impacted the uh, Dyn DNS, right? So can we actually predict something like this happening? Can we actually figure out that this anomalous behavior uh, before it takes place or as it takes place to be able to prevent it, right? So from IT operations, it is a challenge. IoT, you know, beyond even visualization is, a, is another challenging uh, problem uh, to be addressed. So, so what what is the problem uh, sort of after all? Um, so, if we look at the data that's being produced out of all those devices or out of all of the uh, you know even applications and things like that, the, the data is big. It's just a lot of it, right? Uh, the data is complex and high dimensional. So you have a lot of interplay between the different data features, like you know latency in the IOPS and CPU utilizations and memory utilizations. So ultimately, it all has some sort of a meaning uh, versus having a single dimension analysis, right? Uh, so, uh, but the typical tools that exist today, they are primarily focused around uh, sort of presenting more data to you in some sort of a form of dashboard uh, without actually driving you towards the, uh, the actual insight. Well, and uh, of course, the uh, machine learning, this is just an interesting uh, sort of like uh, a little bit of data mining I have done in a, with Google Alerts. ML machine learning is just in general hot. That's why people are interested in, in every area today. Because you know, if you look at what I've data mined, which is basically a Google Alerts with a topic of machine learning versus big data, you can see that machine learning trends that seem to be like growing as big data sort of trends uh, seem to be like. Um, uh, kind of dec decreasing, and in the recent 2016, 2017, there was a big explosion. You can see uh, even in IT operation space, there is a lot of acquisitions happening, a variety of tools uh, that uh, uh, whether do or claim any some form of machine learning. Now. Um, Going back to sort of the IT operations, right, and why it became a uh, such a hot topic, right? Because essentially, as uh, as the uh, applications are being developed, right, those are thrown into some form of a uh, you know operations environment that has to be deployed, and this is where the the, the challenging part comes in. So if you look at the uh, sort of the uh, IT evolution and how it has taken place. I mean, we had something very well confined in a single box, right, where you can sort of control uh, the environment uh, somewhat uh, precisely, you know, now we come into this sort of like what's called a, like a you know, blender effect where you have all those resources working on uh, kind of interrelated to each other, working and sharing resources of the single hardware device. And how do you find the bottlenecks? How do you find uh, sort of the, where the, the areas of contention or degradation are taking place? So something from this like a confined box would come into this really complicated graph of uh, relationships and statistical data. And, you know, and things like even peaceful sort of pictures like this, they kind of blow up the internet to where the, you know, basically, you know, a magazines are not able to, you know, the publishing and digital in general right now is a hot area because, you know, as they publish sort of the uh, materials, how do you figure out whether your infrastructure can support a, you know, sort of a, uh, the, the uh, serving of the material, uh, content that you are um, Producing the, the really the bottom line is the fact that it's it's complicated, right? And uh, the complexity really comes from uh, sort of the all those varieties of knobs that exist today. If you think about it from IT operations, there's all kinds of things that technology is pushing towards the IT operation. You have different types of stacks like a, you know VMware, Microsoft, Amazon, OpenStack, and you have a variety of tools that exist on top of it that try to monitor all those devices. But ultimately, the question is, who is actually going to drive all this stuff, right? And when it comes down to like talking to our users, sometimes when we talk about you know the algorithmic approach of trying to produce sort of the, um, uh, the, the outcome of root cause problems and things like that, they're actually asking for more data. They basically, well, you know, this is all great stuff, but if you actually can get, get me more data out of this LAN or out of the storage array, I think this is what I'm really looking for. 
Well, let's look at the data that's being produced uh, out of the virtualization environment. So a simple virtualization environment with 100 virtual machines roughly has about 2,000 objects, right? Which is basically, if you look at the virtual disks, CPUs, network uh, ports, network switches, and things like that, right? And out of that, you get about 640, 604 uh, million you know, data points that you have to analyze. And this is basically something that we actually run in our lab so to speak, so it's very small. Now, the customers that we're talking to is roughly around about 3,000 virtual machines. So they have to deal with 50,000 objects which produce roughly about 15 billion data points. So, I mean, how can you possibly find sort of the, uh, any type of, you know, understand what's happening with anything in this infrastructure uh, when you're looking, uh, you're using the tools that are not basically either threshold driven or just provide you the data. I think the data and more data is not really the right answer. It's sort of like trying to obtain the uh, you know, the information, the insight of this data is, is what really needs to be the solution to this, uh, the problem. Uh, however, the IT operations sort of like they still, uh, you know, uh, try to solve this with a, like kind of a chisel and a hammer kind of approach, right? You know, because, you know, the, all the tools that have been um, existing so far, uh, they have been... Uh, uh, primarily came out of the physical environment where everything was confined. Uh, they have added some form of a API. However, you have this kind of like, uh, you know, the um, the Frankenstein, you know, those dashboards that basically produce more data, but you know that you can't really make any any anything out of it. So the bottom line is, you know, the data is flowing into those conventional tools. There's a lot of them, a lot of IT operation guys that we talk to, they sometimes use 27 to 30 tools, right? But however, they, some of them they completely bought because they uh, had to as part of some deal and don't even use it. Some of them uh, they uh, use for some so segments or some silos like networking, but, no, but it still produces a lot of kind of noise and they don't actually have a solution, a good solution to to help them to address those problems. Now, if we're talking about uh, in terms of the uh, state of the art of the tools that exist today, right? So you have the tools where basically, as I mentioned, apply the computer science approach, which is basically, for the most part, uh, the alert suppression, right? Uh, the approaches of anomaly detections are also pretty old school, meaning that they're actually single dimensional. So, you know, you in some way, you're able to identify anomalies in CPU utilization, for example, right, or memory utilization. However, it doesn't really um, provide you with uh, uh, meaningful information whether it's, you know, whether it's bad or not. You know, for example, uh, you know, uh, IOPS by themselves uh, going, um, you know, going high may not actually mean anything bad because until latencies start being introduced as part of that, that's when it becomes meaningful. So, you know, again, single dimensional and false negatives as a result of it. And also personalization is very important because each industry, each, uh, you know, each virtualization environment or IT operations environment, it really depends on the, you know, seasonality of the data and how it's being used. Like, you know, you have retail businesses that operate in one way, you know, digital businesses operate in another way. And, and, and things like that. So ultimately, uh, all the conventional tools that exist today, they still create a lot of noise, whether they use the threshold, which is really bad, or even uh, sort of like uh, a, a bridge into this uh, data analysis uh, in some form of uh, anomaly detection. So the question is like, is there a solution that sort of, uh, that's kind of strange. Uh, the picture disappeared, but uh, is there a solution that can address this problem? So uh, here I'll just uh, introduce um, the approach that we have taken, uh, which we call topological behavior analysis, which is based on uh, topological data analysis. So the effect of it where you ap uh, apply a uh, analysis of the shape of the data uh, towards identifying anomalies in the multidimensional space. So. Um, at high level, uh, the way it works is uh, essentially we obtain the information from infrastructure, uh, which is on your left here, and uh, from that we extract uh, sort of the relationships to those within the objects in infrastructure, how virtual machines relate to virtual disk data stores and things like that. And then we're able to characterize uh, the um, 
of the actual individual metric behaviors. So for that, and I'll talk about it in, in this next uh, slide, we actually use k-means clustering that provides us ability to capture the, uh, the seasonality <coughs> of, of, of the data, how, how certain workloads behave, uh, for example, in particular hour of the day, uh, you know, uh, day of the week, week of the month, uh, month of the quarter, and uh, uh, quarter of the year, and things like that. Uh, then what's uh, the, so the, that then we basically uh, using topological data analysis we are able to um, essentially transpose that into a multi-dimensional analysis to where we able to uh, find uh, the interplay and derive the interplay between like IOPS and latencies for example and where those behaviors are anomalous and once those behaviors become anomalous uh, which you know, they're supposed to be more meaningful uh, when it comes down to identifying the true root cause of the problem. Uh, we fit it into our uh, root cause uh, uh, algorithm, which is based on the Bayesian networks, uh, which is uh, basically fed with probabilistic models to be able to derive, uh, based on certain observations, uh, who, um, under different circumstances, uh, is the root cause of the problem. Um, so, as far as the, um, the algorithm goes, uh, the what we do is you know as you can see here uh, we you know, if you're familiar with uh, uh, k-means uh, we have been able to figure out uh, based on the variance of the data uh, how <clears throat> how many uh, essentially centroids would would be applied to a particular uh, metric uh, based on uh, uh, basically a density function as well as the um, and basically on the density function whether we need to recluster uh, the uh, recluster further to be able to uh, derive the uh, Gaussian distribution uh, within the cluster and once we actually uh, find uh, those uh, clusters that we're looking for the behavior, we actually, uh, you know, sort of uh, create a, a shape of the behavior, essentially, which would so look something like this, right? So essentially it's, you know, instead of fo focusing on the clusters themselves and uh, in the multidimensional analysis, we basically create a shape, essentially, of the behavior. And then we start sort of overlapping that in a multidimensional space where you basically have, you know, sort of a, you know, if you if you take the shape that I have presented, which could be like a, a, you know, Sunday through Sunday behavior, once you start wrapping it around, you create a sort of a form of a donut, right? And this is where you can find the cyclical, uh, define those cyclical behaviors in the metrics. And, and as you introduce other uh, dimensions, like for example, you can find the, like as I mentioned, like IOPS and latencies, essentially you create this kind of a multidimensional uh, shape uh, from which later, uh, as you start feeding the data, Data in real time to figure out the anomalies, you're able to identify uh, what are the, whether this uh, particular um, data point that comes in is anomalous. And then uh, from, uh, pro from that point, uh, you can basically figure out whether what objects has been involved and in fit it in the a, in a root cause and causality algorithm, so to speak. Um, so as far as the, uh, you know, of course, you know, there is all kinds of aspects of the uh, things uh, we can do with clustering. Uh, the interesting things about the k-means is the fact that uh, it provides us ability to uh, introduce some uh, practical aspects of it, uh, where we essentially able to, uh, for example, uh, provide ability for the users to uh, tell us whether, for example, while we have learned certain type of behaviors uh, as normal, however, those not necessarily may be normal uh, to the environment, whether they want to know about it by basically tagging the clusters, right? So you can imagine some behaviors could be considered normal because they actually form those clusters that we consider the behavioral, uh, you know, well, if the user is interested in seeing that, we can actually tag those clusters uh, based on user input and still produce the uh, outcome they might be interested in. Uh, and another aspect of it uh, could be uh, the fact that, you know, there is always in IT operations some blackout dates where perhaps the behavior should not be learned. So we can basically artificially introduce the uh, clusters that would represent the behavior where certain things could be ignored, both from learning perspective as well as the detection. Um, also from the experimentations and the input from the users, we have learned that um, 
you know, sometimes the algorithm requires some adjustment based on the uh, type of the uh, environment that's being run. For example, telecommunication environment can be more sensitive to the latency versus traditional IT operations that perhaps may be less sensitive to the latency. So we have introduced this uh, concept of a, a sensitivity, uh, which is basically not a simple sort of a, a buffer that uh, goes around uh, statically, but actually incorporates uh, the concept of the uh, median, uh, the mean, essentially, and the standard deviations. Because, you know, as you can imagine, um, for example, when the uh, data has a, a low mean and uh, low variance, like, for example, latency data, right, the sensitivity uh, or buffer that we introduce should be, uh, be at a more, smaller scale versus, for example, when you have a lot of data, variance in the data, like, for example, whether you're looking at IOPS or CPU utilization, as well as higher means, once again, IOPS, for example, the, the sensitivity uh, buffer should be uh, much higher to make it more meaningful for, for those use cases. So really what we have found in, in, in our product, is, for our product, is that topological behavior analysis, you just kind of briefly went through that I hope kind of made sense to, uh, uh, to, to most of you, uh, is the, the solution. And, it, and it's actually proven to be a very practical approach since it's, uh, you know, when we actually deploy it in the user environments that traditionally deploy um, you know, more, more traditional tools. Uh, it actually reveals quite interesting information uh, which has not been found by the users uh, otherwise. So I think this is kind of proves the fact that uh, not only uh, sort of the, um, the algorithm works, at least uh, on the use cases that we hit so far, but I'm sure we will learn a lot and perhaps we'll have to make some adjustments, uh, but also the sort of the machine learning uh, itself uh, brings the value to IT operations because it's sort of, it's, uh, it's uh, growing from both from popularity and a, and a sort of a buzz as well as has uh, some application that I think is very valuable to the customers. So um, as far as what's next, I mean, I ultimately I think this is where uh, sort of the, uh, the vision that we have is the fact that ultimately uh, the, uh, the brains behind the IT operations is going to be uh, some uh, some basically machine learning algorithm that provides uh, possibly even automated approach towards IT operations. And um, when it comes down to what is really machine learning, I mean, if you think about it, it's, you know, if, you know, what I have talked about, what the customers are uh, thinking in terms of machine learning, we're trying to educate the market, which is sort of a little bit challenging for, uh, for, uh, for the company of our size, like, because we're not Google or uh, such. It's, it is really about the science. It is about algorithms. It is about the... Um, uh, it is about the pattern recognition uh, versus uh, some form of like basically proxy that's being used to understand what machine learning is and claim it uh, to be either data or automation and things like that. Well, and um, I think what's also very important, uh, both for like either if you're in IT operations, in the DevOps or application development, it's sort of a uh, brush up on the algorithm because I think the expert knowledge is extremely important for machine learning. And as I mentioned, uh, sort of like the, the power, the reason why we picked clustering, for example, because it's provided us the ability to incorporate sort of the, uh, the, the customer input or the user input into how, you know, they would like to see the outcome to be like, for example, whether we need to adjust the probability of our uh, root cause analysis uh, to, f to ultimately figure out who, uh, what the root cause of the problem is, or even uh, perhaps the anomaly uh, detection that we are leverage. I mean, from the perspective of education, of course, there is a, uh, you know, great uh, materials uh, uh, out there to uh, learn about uh, different types of toolkits available as well as the, and as well as the application uh, of machine learning to some of the use cases. And of course, the, uh, there are many tools in uh, open source communities that today available to, to this. Like for example, the recent, you know, we, we used heavily uh, R, for example, to visualize the data uh, when we uh, look at the use cases. Uh, in our use cases, they basically kind of expanded beyond the root cause analysis. We actually also uh, recently introduced pretty successfully the uh, use cases around predicting performance issues. So you can imagine as you learn the behavior of the workloads, you can actually predict when certain capacity or constraints will take place. Uh, for that, we, for example, use Monte Carlo simulations to figure out uh, out of the clustering uh, what 
uh, how the workflows will behave and how much, what kind of impact they would have to infrastructure. We also use Medly pretty heavily because uh, it's uh, it's in 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 database uh, algorithm algorithms that can be run very effectively and fast. Uh, we are currently looking at the transfer flow to upgrade our uh, network uh, from um, something that we kind of baked ourselves to uh, essentially a uh, much more scalable engine and, and Spark as well. I think from the most part, uh, I mean, there is other tools I, I mentioned here, but I think for the most part, uh, I think there's definitely machine learning. It can bring the value uh, to IT operations, and uh, uh, that's why we're here to basically proving that. So if you guys have any questions, I think I kind of blew through this pretty. Yeah, go ahead. Is that time to, to do this? Sorry, I'm just making sure. Well, I was going to say we might want to hold the questions okay. until after Alan has had a chance to go, and then we can get into. Yeah, my apologies. I, I probably asked for it ahead of time. So. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> yep. And I obviously introduced that enthusiasm. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. So I guess there's going to be uh, questions afterwards. So. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, everybody can hear me okay, I assume. So uh, I'm Alan Fern. I'm from the uh, Oregon State University uh, School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. I'm a computer scientist. I've been there for a good 12 years now. I study artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we, we're sort of at the research end of that. And I'm, I'm going to, I kind of want to make this a fun talk. I, I don't know if you'll find it fun, but I, I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, some of the interesting things that have happened in AI um, very recently. So who, who remembers this? Right? So uh, I was, I was uh, an undergrad, and I actually watched this on ESPN. They had chess on ESPN. Uh, this is Gary Kasparov uh, being beat by IBM's uh, Deep Blue uh, computer. And this was 1997. It was the first time that a computer beat the world champion in chess. So it's kind of a landmark. So AI uh, researchers like to set these challenge problems. And this is a good example of one of them. Uh, another one uh, that uh, is in recent memory. Uh, who remembers this? All right. So uh, you could watch this on TV. This was uh, IBM's Watson uh, playing Ken Jennings and somebody else. I don't remember his name in Jeopardy. And, and this was not nearly as compelling for me as the chess game because Watson was just way too good. Right? It was basically a half hour of, OK, Watson, what's the answer? OK, Watson, what's the answer? But, but it was really an amazing uh, piece of technology uh, showing you know, a pretty good advancement in information extraction, query answering. Um, so that was another example. And there's been lots of other challenge problems. Uh, but the most recent one that I think is uh, very interesting to me is this. Uh, does anybody, who has heard of DeepMind and AlphaGo? Right. So this is probably not as well known in the US, at least, uh, because it involves Go, which is a game that's not very well known in the US. But this was a, a landmark in AI, and I'm going to talk to you about this today. Um, so it's another board game that we beat the best humans at, and you know you can ask, so what? Um, I, I'm going to try to convince you that uh, there is some very interesting technology behind this. Uh, there's been some very recent advances that came together to make this possible, and uh, my lab and uh, and some of my colleagues study this type of technology, and it's really not just about board games. I think at the end I'll show you some examples of the types of problems we're trying to apply this to. And I'm hoping that, uh, that this will get your minds uh, churning and maybe we'll be able to work together. So, so before I move on, I just want to point out that uh, you know, a little bit south uh, at Oregon State University, we have a pretty big group of uh, professors that do research in machine learning, uh, AI, and, and data science. And so this is 
my sales pitch, uh, if you're a small company interested in this sort of thing, you want to look at SBIR, STTR possibilities, you know, contact me and I can uh, tell you who would be the best person to work with. Bigger companies, we love to work on, uh, on real world problems. So just keep that in mind. We have a big group of people there, experts in machine learning, AI, and data science. And, and it would be great if we could, uh, could uh, you know, cook them up with industry a little bit more tightly. So without further ado, what is Go? Who's ever played Go? Wow, a lot of people have played Go. Um, it's a, it's a non-standard non distribution of people here, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but the, so, so Go is a game that is played usually on a 19 by 19 board. Um, you take turns putting down stones. One person's white, one person, one person is black. And it's actually a fairly uh, simple game conceptually. Uh, you're trying to get territory, and you get territory by surrounding your opponent's stones. If you surround your opponent's stones, you take their stones, and that's your territory. And uh, you play the game until both people decide not to uh, play anymore, and you count up the territory, and the person wins that has the most territory. And this has been a big challenge for AI um, for a good 40 years. Um, and uh, let's look at the history of Computer Go. So 1997, as I said, we, play, uh, super, we started playing superhuman chess. Right? And nowadays, superhuman chess can be played on a laptop like this. It will be any human in the world. Um, so that, that's been solved for a long time. Go, though, even as recently as 2005, AI researchers and pretty much everybody thought computer Go was impossible. You know, 30, 40 years of research have gone into this, and they were still not able to beat even uh, moderately good amateurs. And that's a big difference uh, compared to chess. And why is that? You know, why, why are these games so different? There's, there's several reasons, but, but I think this, uh, this shows you uh, a picture that you know, we start with tic-tac-toe, we go to chess, and we go to Go. And, and one, one answer is Go is just a bigger game. Um, and let's see what I mean by that. So, so how can you uh, play tic-tac-toe with a computer? If any of you have taken a basic AI course, um, uh, what you do is you can uh, start at the position of tic-tac-toe that, that you happen to be in, and then you can just build what we call a tree of all the possible moves that you and your opponent could do. And this tree will end up in a situation like this, where uh, one side is one, and this side where it's been, it was a tie. What you can do is you can analyze this tree and figure out which move at the, uh, the root, the state we're at, will lead to a tie or a win. Right? And tic-tac-toe is a small enough game that you can just build this tree out in, in uh, milliseconds, probably even faster than that. Now, you try to do the same thing for chess. Right? This is called minimax search in AI terminology. And the problem is chess is so much bigger of a game. There are many more situations. You can't build the entire tree. Okay? You just can't do it. Well, you could, but, but you'd uh, be waiting forever. And so you build part of the tree. Right? I'm just trying to illustrate that this is a really big tree. You build part of the tree, you go down as deep as you can with the time you have, and you end up with a tree, and at the leaves of this tree, there are situations that are neither checkmate for either side nor draw. And so what do you do with that? Well, what has to be done is uh, people have to come up with what's called an evaluation function. It takes a position that happens to be at a leaf, and it will give it a score. So it will give it a plus one score if it's definitely a win for white, minus one score if it's definitely a win for black, and something in between. This indicates that it looks favorable for white. Right? So this is based on you know, people go in and define what an evaluation function is. And when you evaluate all the leaves, you can back propagate all the information up to the root and figure out what action looks best right now. Okay? So that's how chess is, is, is basically built. And for 40 years, people tried to build Go programs using this basic approach. And it was a complete and utter failure, even though it worked for chess. Why? Well, well one reason is size, as we're showing. Um, in chess, roughly, the number of possible moves per position, if you average over the game, is about 35. In Go, the number of possible moves per position is, well, how many, square, how many squares are open here? Um, it's about 250 if you average throughout the game. So obviously, that's, 
It's a much bigger space of possibilities. And chess, you can play superhuman level chess if you can analyze about 14 moves into the future. And they can do that with today's hardware and the search algorithms. Go, you need to go much further. You need to go hundreds of moves into the future. Um, but maybe even the most important thing, and I think it's being cut off a little bit, but, uh, but I'll tell you what's there, the board evaluation function. For chess, you can get an evaluation function by partly looking at the you know, material value, right? A rook's more than, worth more than a pawn, so you can add up the material value. You can also hire grandmasters to give you uh, features of boards that are useful for evaluating positions. And they were able to do that very well for chess. For Go, all the pieces are the same value, more or less, when you look at it just in terms of the piece. Um, people were never able to come up with a good evaluation function for Go. Is, is, you know, and, and they tried for 30 years. A very subtle change, you know, removing this black stone could flip the board from one side to the other. And so that, that was what maybe the biggest problem in Go. Uh, nobody was able to come up with good evaluation functions. So that's sort of the state of computer Go at 2005. Then uh, the next year, um, people started playing with a new type of search algorithm uh, called Monte Carlo Tree Search. And they used a little bit of machine learning, not a lot at the time. And they started to get some really impressive performances. Um, in two years' time, the computer Go server rating for these algorithms went from 1,800, ELO is just a way of measuring uh, game playing performance, to 2,600. So you know, there were 30 years of research like this, and then bam, two years, it went, it skyrocketed. And people got pretty excited. Now this was 9 by 9 Go, a much smaller board, but still, the 30 years of research on 9 by 9 was pretty flat as well. So that was pretty exciting. So Monte Carlo Tree Search was kind of a pivotal moment. Uh, and I'll, I'll be talking to you about that, what, what that means. Then uh, a couple years, four years later, they started uh, playing 19 by 19, had some success. This was kind of a, you know, it's kind of something to talk about, but you gave, give a really good player four... You give the computer a four-stone handicap, which is pretty significant, and it was able to beat a really good player. Right? They had never done that before. But around this time, it seemed like the, the advances were flattening out. Right? People are just tweaking things here and there, and it's flattening out. And it's pretty clear that something major has to happen before you're going to beat the world champion in Go. Now, three years later, um, just last year, the end of last year, uh, DeepMind started applying deep neural networks uh, to soup up Monte Carlo Tree Search. And they had a very exciting result, which was they beat the European champion 5-0. So that, that was very exciting. I was at the AI conference where they announced this. Um, but, but there was still a big question. The European champion compared to the world champion, because Go is really an Asian game. If you think of chess as being the intellectual European game, Go is the equivalent in Asian countries, right? That's the deep intellectual game. Uh, Asian, you know, the Asian champions can beat the European champion, you know, nine times out of ten. So, so it was still very unclear whether we could beat the best people in the world um, with, uh, with this technology. But in March, it happened. So Lisa Dahl is, he's always one of the top two or three players in the world in Go. Uh, he's you know, been a world champion many times. He's like the Roger Federer of Go playing. Uh, AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol 4-1 uh, in, in March, and it was a pretty, pretty big achievement. It was, in, in Japan and the Asian countries, this was a big deal. It was on all the networks. Here, I don't think it was covered quite, quite as much, but, uh, but it, it, it was interesting. Uh, and and this, this was not done with uh, a laptop. So we're, we're looking at some major, uh, major uh, compute requirements. But still, um, a year, year before that, we didn't know how to use this compute uh, power to play Go at a world championship level. So there were some major advances. And I'm going to spend a little time talking to you, you know, just giving you a flavor of what those advances were. So AlphaGo combines a few things. This Monte Carlo tree search I talked about, deep learning, which Probably a lot of you have heard this buzzword. Uh, huge data sets of Go databases, 
and reinforcement learning, and you, you put all of that together with high performance computing, right? That's AlphaGo. And I'm going to walk you through a few of these things to give you the highlights of how AlphaGo works. So first, let's talk about Monte Carlo tree search. What does that mean? Well, one of the first things that, that was a bit surprising, um, that it kind of turned the tables on Go playing, was, uh, remember, remember I said evaluating a Go board, getting a function that can give you a score for how good a Go position is for white versus black, was something that people were not able to figure out until uh, they uh, tried the following. So let's take two monkeys who are not good at Go. In fact, they know nothing about Go. Uh, they, know, they know to put down white and black pieces on empty squares. That's, that's all they know. And so they're going to play random games. And let's have these monkeys play many random games, hundreds or thousands of random games, and keep track of whether the black monkey wins more or the white monkey wins more. And we're going to use that ratio as our score for how good this board is. So you have two monkeys, start with this board position, play games of Go one after another, and you keep track of who wins more. And that turned out to be a relatively good evaluation function. And AlphaGo is going to leverage that observation. Uh, primarily, we're, we're going to replace these monkeys with something that's a little better than monkeys and still use the idea of playing out games to evaluate boards as opposed to trying to compute features of boards and, and assign weights to them. Okay? So that was the first idea. The second major idea in Monte Carlo tree search was, uh, I'm going to call it non-uniform tree expansion. So in chess and in most other algorithms, the search algorithms that are used for chess, they more or less uniformly expand the search tree. Right? So they'll consider most, line, most lines that are 14 or, or you know, 12, uh, 13 uh, moves out equally. So the tree is kind of flat. And this isn't, you know, they, they do spend time trying to explore more promising areas a bit more, but, but it's mostly a uniform search. Monte Carlo tree search, uh, you know, since Go, you need to go so much further into the game to get useful information, you have to expand the tree more non-uniformly. Like, humans are very good at non-uniformly expanding the tree, going down promising lines. And Monte Carlo tree search, using some fancy uh, techniques, which I won't get into, has a special way of uh, biasing the tree expansion towards more promising lines. So over here, it looks like you know, this move, you know, you're not going to explore this area very much because maybe that move's not looking promising, but it explored this area much more. So I'm not going to talk about the algorithm behind that, but there were some interesting advances in how do you expand trees. And so Monte Carlo tree search has that aspect, and then at the leaves, you're going to use this monkey evaluation function and that turning point in 2005 or 2006 was basically these two ideas together uh, with a little bit of machine learning uh, to play Go. And this did better than anything that had been thought of in the last 30 years. It was a bit annoying to those people who had worked in the area for so long because they were seeing these two monkeys and they're like, man, we've been working really hard on you know, making sophisticated algorithms to analyze Go positions and none of that really was in this. So, the question is, how can we do better? As I said, uh, progress kind of stagnated at that point. And uh, the question is, what can you do? Well, one thing that humans are very good at is uh, trying to predict, uh, you know, a good Go player can look at a board position and almost instantaneously tell you the promising moves. It's a very visual game. Subconsciously, they can just say what the most promising moves are. And they use that a lot uh, when they play to, to sort of guide their thinking, right? And so one way to improve would be to try to maybe use machine learning to learn to predict Go moves, try to learn the intuition of experts, for example. And if you did that, you might be able to replace these monkeys by whatever you learned, right? Things, something that's better at playing Go than monkeys. And you could also expand the tree in more intelligent ways, even more intelligent ways. And so that's, uh, that's really what uh, DeepMind uh, set out to do. And they set out to do that with deep neural networks. And why, why are deep neural networks relevant here? Well, let's say that we're trying to learn to predict good moves, right? A, a classic, there, there are data sets out there of expert Go games that have board positions like this paired with the move that the expert made. 
right? So that's sort of a supervised training set that you could maybe analyze and try to uh, learn to predict, given a board position, what an expert would do. Now, traditional machine learning uh, did not work for this because it required people to hand code features of go positions. And then the machine learning algorithm would try to weigh those features together to predict moves. Um, and as I said, people were not very good at hand coding features of, of, of Go positions. And so the key insight was that really a Go board is an image, right? It's a three valued image. It has, each pixel can either be black, white, or empty. And there had been some major advances in what's in a field called computer vision, which is all about analyzing images and trying to get computers to understand them. And so it's a, made some sense to try to apply that technology to Go boards, which are very much like images. And that's what they did. So just a little bit of background. Uh, so, so computer vision is about trying to understand images with computers. So a classic problem might be, given an image of a cat or a dog, you want the computer to tell you whether it's a cat or a dog, right? This is trivial for humans, exceedingly hard for computers. I mean, it's embarrassingly hard for computers. And uh, the, the nice thing is, very recently, um, there, there have been major advances in our ability to analyze images. Uh, we work on a lot of this at Oregon State. And this is where deep neural networks come in. So a, a deep neural network is nothing more than a big circuit with lots of parameters, millions or even billions of parameters. You feed in an image, and it goes through this circuit, and it spits out cat or dog. And the question is, how do you set the parameters? Well, people figured out that uh, if you use giant data sets of cats and dog images, and that you label them as cats and dogs, we're talking millions of images, uh, you can set these parameters using uh, some relatively simple learning algorithms. And they get state-of-the-art performance, right? Computer vision now as a field, it's really uh, been taken over by deep learning. There are very few computer vision uh, papers that do not use deep learning in some way. And so, so the, you know, what came together was they used GPUs to implement these neural networks to actually compute them because they're pretty expensive to compute. And they use massive data sets. And those things together made it so that we can now uh, recognize cats and dogs fairly reliably in images. Right? So how about Go positions? Well, a Go position, we can just treat it as an image, feed it through a neural network, and maybe we could predict what move uh, an expert player would make. You know, why not try that? And that's what, uh, that's what Deep, uh, DeepMind did. And the answer was yes, you could actually uh, do this fairly well. So here's a picture of, you know, a conceptual picture of the network. So you give the board position as input to this network, lots of layers of uh, neural network. And then at the top, it's going to output values for every possible move, right? And higher bars mean that it thinks that this is a more likely, more likely to be a good move, okay? What they were able to do is they trained this thing for three weeks on 30 million expert moves. So, so only Google can do this. DeepMind is a Google company. Who knows how many cloud computers are using for this? But three weeks of training with a god-awful number of computers and 30 million expert moves, they were able to achieve a 57% accuracy at predicting uh, expert Go moves, which is really amazing given the number of moves that are possible and the fact that probably a lot of the uh, experts are inconsistent in their choices. Right? There are probably multiple good moves, and the expert chose one uh, versus the other. So this is pretty amazing. And just this simple circuit could already beat a lot of the state-of-the-art Go programs based on Monte Carlo tree search. So that, that really got people thinking. But how can you go beyond that? Right? Uh, you, you can keep on adding more and more data, but you're really you're going to hit diminishing returns doing that. And you're really only learning to mimic human play. Right? You can never go really beyond that. And so one way to go beyond that would be to try to get the computer to play itself and learn by sort of experience and playing the game, come up with situations that are not in the database and figure out what to do. And that's exactly uh, what uh, the field of reinforcement learning is about. Having a computer try to solve a problem by some randomized exploration and learn how to solve the problem better. 
Um, and I won't go into the details of reinforcement learning, but basically, after you trained AlphaGo with all this data, they had AlphaGo play itself for months and months and months. And when AlphaGo wins, well, one side's always going to win, right? And that side gets a plus one. If it loses, it gets a minus one. And we treat that as a reward, right? That's why it's called reinforcement learning. You're giving a dog a reward, a positive or negative reward. And after doing this for months and months, it learns to play even better than it did originally with just the supervised data. So as I said, it did this for months and months. And what ended up happening is this new network that was trained could beat the original network that we started with 80% of the time. So it learned through self-play to do quite a bit better. Um, and it could be the best Go playing programs previously uh, by, with an 85% uh, win rate. So, and this is with no search whatsoever. It's just looking at a board and bam, here's the answer. It's like you know, a chess master or a, a Go master walking around tables, uh, just looking at a board and move there. And so it was able to beat the best programs doing that. Uh, so it was pretty amazing. But it was not close to professional level yet, just this network. And it's kind of, uh, kind of uh, it makes sense, right? Uh, a, the world champion will not play at a world championship level if you make him answer in a second, right? Uh, there's some deliberation that seems necessary. The world champion has a lot of intuition that maybe we can think of that as being boiled up in this deep network, but you still need some sort of a deliberation and search wrapped around it. And so uh, one idea, let's go back to Monte Carlo tree search. We can replace these monkeys with a deep network that we learned, right? And then we can just do these simulations and we'll get a better board evaluation. They weren't able to quite do that because these take too long to evaluate. So we're talking to play a full game with these two uh, uh, networks, it took milliseconds. And milliseconds is actually a big deal because they want to expand the tree as, uh, as deeply as possible. And so if you're spending a lot of time evaluating leaves, you're not doing other stuff to expand the tree. So instead what they did is they used smaller neural networks that could be evaluated much more quickly. They weren't as good, but they were much faster for this board evaluation. They didn't throw away the really good network. Instead, what they do is they use it to guide the expansion of this tree. So you can think of it as, you know, when, when a Go master is looking at positions and thinking ahead, they're using their intuition about what positions they should be thinking about. And that's what this network was used for. So any move that gets high bars, they're going to be more likely to be explored by the tree search. So this is basically AlphaGo. You've got a deep network on top of Monte Carlo tree search, um, guiding the, about the expansion of the tree and guiding the leaf evaluation. And this is what beat uh, Lisa at all. So in between the beating the European champion, AlphaGo actually improved by a lot. So the, you know, Lee Sadal, the he was looking at these games of the European champion. He's like, oh, I could beat AlphaGo because AlphaGo was making some mistakes that he could see. You know, no, none of us could, could even imagine seeing the mistakes, but he could. Uh, between that game and, and, uh, and Lee Sadal, they had it self-play for a long time, and, and AlphaGo got a lot better. And then it ended up beating Lee Sadal. So, so it was a pretty interesting event. So that's basically... Uh, you know, what I have to say about AlphaGo, gives, it gives you some idea of the internals. Now, so what, right? Can, we can beat uh, computers at board games. And I would say that uh, basically uh, in five, 10 years, we'll be like, oh, well, of course computers can beat us at board games. It's like computers can beat us at calculator, at uh, doing calculations. Uh, we, we, we won't compete with them. But what I'm interested in is applying these same ideas to real problems. So if we think about uh, the basic idea behind AlphaGo, you've got high-performance computing, simulators of a domain that happen to be Go in this case, optimization and search and machine learning, um, and out pops rational decisions, right? And, and so, uh, so rational decision-making is the research area I work in. We try to plug in other types of simulators, other types of problems into this box and use the same type of machinery. 
So we've looked at emergency response, forest fire management, smart grids, and other problems. And I'm going to give you just an example of two problems that we've looked at, and then I'll wrap up. So this is a fun problem we looked at uh, a bunch of years ago. Uh, this, is this is trying to uh, manage the emergency response system in Corvallis. So 911 calls come in, and you have to respond to them by choosing units to send from different fire stations around town. And you have to choose that in a smart way so that you don't expend all your resources in one place and end up having a fire or an emergency way over there, and it takes you forever to get there. So the fire chief's job, one of the jobs uh, of the fire chief, is to design the policies that are used to dispatch units whenever a 911 call comes in. And we were very curious, well, how good are the current dispatch policies, right? These are not, no computers were used to design these. Uh, can you do better? And uh, what we did is we got three years of 911 call data, built a simulator that simulates 911 calls coming in, you know, moving trucks around according to certain policies. And we used these types of techniques to try to optimize the policies. It turned out that uh, Corvallis was pretty well funded at that time. And it was hard for us to uh, improve sort of the basic performance metrics, like time to first response. That's a big performance metric they care about. But what we did find is we found solutions with the computer that hit the same performance metrics with a you know, little bit better, but did not use one of the fire stations, which, which was very surprising to us. Um, we, we told the fire chief this, and he was not a, actually surprised, because that fire station was built with the future in mind. Basically, there was a pot of money. You have to use it now, or you can't use it at all. So they built a station, and they were hoping that's going to be useful in the future. Um, it was interesting, a couple years later, uh, you don't have to read this, but uh, funding was not quite so good, and they had to shut down a fire station, and that was the one they picked. Um, I'm not saying it was because of our software. I think the fire chief would have figured it out himself, but, but they could have used our software, and it would have made the right choice. So that was pretty interesting um, uh, use case of this type of technology. Uh, one final one that I'll talk about, I'm working with some power systems folks at Oregon State University on some smart grid problems. Uh, blackouts are a problem. They're going to be a bigger problem uh, with our infrastructure aging. Uh, basically, right now, the power grid is supposed to be what's called N minus 1 stable, which means if one power line goes down, uh, it's supposed to be stable. You're not supposed to get a rolling blackout. If two lines go down, however, um, a lot of bad things can happen. Uh, and, and a lot of times, this is the result of why we have our lights go out. Uh, things get hot, you get these, uh, in the worst case, cascading blackouts. And this is sort of uh, what we all are trying to avoid. Um, what happens when this starts going on is uh, operators have to decide what to do. And there are certain actions they can do. They can do load shedding. They can do islanding. The details of those don't matter. But these are very fast decisions they need to make that have big ramifications. And they're not using a lot of automated computer uh, analysis to make these decisions uh, in real time. So we uh, were very interested in, could we apply uh, computers to this problem? Uh, you know, should you island or load shed? Where should you do it? When should you do it, right, when, when some of these problems occur? And I won't go into uh, the analysis, but we had a paper come out on this, and we show that, that we can actually do quite a bit better than some of the default policies out there right now. So, uh, so this is just another example of an application of this type of technology. So I'll just wrap up. You know, we talked about Go. You know, we're playing superhuman Go. Uh, why can't we do, play superhuman real-world stuff, you know, smart cities? That's how I think about this. Why, why limit it to board games? And I showed you a couple of examples. Uh, we, we have a lot more than this. And I just like to plant the seed um, you know, your problem could go here. What would it be? So with that, I'll wrap up. And we'll have questions. Yeah.